Uh, good morning all. Today is Monday, February 22nd. I hope you had a, uh, a restful, uh, busy, but safe weekend. Uh, we finished off the lymphatic system uh, last week, and so now we are on this week, we're going to be talking about uh, basically our body defenses and our immune responses and talking about the different levels and types of organizations along with that. Uh, today's lecture should finish early. Uh, we've got uh, four very lecture intensive classes for the next four classes because my goal is to get through all of the material over the next four lectures so that Monday, March 8th, we just have to do presentations. If we run behind on lecture, then we'll have to lecture a little bit before the groups present, and that makes for an incredibly long day. So uh, we are going to suffer through four relatively long days of lecture. Uh, to be able to get through all of this, but I'm still hoping to finish a little bit early today to give you some time to continue class time to continue to work on organizing and uh, and preparing for your group presentations. Um, today will also be the last day. Hopefully you've spent some time working on that over the weekend. And if any of you are uncomfortable with the project that you're doing, either because you don't feel you have enough information or it isn't what you want to do. Today is the last day to change that. Uh, there is still an opportunity to, to uh, switch to other topics if that is something that people want to do as a group. Um, and we will do that today. So if there's any issues or anything along those lines, today's the day to bring those up uh, in the class time that we'll have. Again, I don't expect this to be uh, enough time for you to finish these projects. You are expected to work on them outside of the classroom. But remember that can be done synchronously or asynchronously. I remember you've all got uh, a discussion boards set up for you to um, uh, for you to work on and also remember for me you need to get on that uh, group uh, discussion board and your first or if it's already if you've already used your discussion board there should be a, a post there that has the name of everybody in your group and also your group topic uh, so make sure you do that as well uh, because I expect you to be working on your group presentations there's only a couple assignments for this section these are things that we would kind of normally kind of do in the classroom, like the ELISA test and things along those lines. Uh, so we have our Physio X Exercise 12, that is uh, Exercise 12 only Activity 3, that is due Monday of the 1st. Remember, uh, Wednesday this week is not on here, Wednesday the 24th, not because we don't have class. We absolutely positively have class, um, but uh, nothing is due. These are really just when assignments are due. Uh, Wednesday next week, your labster uh, intro to immunology is, is uh, due. I remember you must complete all of it, get it 80% correct for full credit on that. Remember also next week, we have that Friday at 6 p.m. Uh, due time for your outlines. Again, that doesn't mean to wait till Friday at 5.59 p.m. to submit them. Once your outlines are done, then please submit them. Uh, but I want them by uh, Friday, 6 p.m. so that I can post them so students have the weekend to either download them if they like or look at them or print them out or whatever it is that they want to do uh, because you are all responsible for this material on the exams. If you do not have your outline to me by 6 p.m. on Friday, you will lose 10 out of your 50 points on this assignment. So that is a huge, huge chunk. There is no excuse for late outlines. You have plenty of time to prepare for this. Do not wait to the last second to submit them. Uh, and then the following week uh, is all you all the time. Group presentations on Monday and lab and lecture exam on Wednesday. All right. And then from there, uh, pun intended, we get a nice palate cleanser uh, with the digestive system. All right. That is the game plan. Pretty straightforward and simple. Any questions on that? All righty, stunned silence is my favorite thing to have first thing in the morning. Excellent. Let us dive into lecture then. Let me bring the lecture up. There we go. So here is the game plan uh, for uh, the, uh, the section. Uh, we are going to, again, talk about our immune response and our body defenses. 
Uh, of course, first we need to know what we're defending ourselves against. Then we will talk both about our non-specific and specific body defenses. Uh, my goal is to talk to you primarily about how it is supposed to work. Uh, for those of you who have taken micro, or for those of you, shame on you, who are currently taking micro, uh, there is a fair amount of overlap in these two uh, classes in this part. So uh, as for me, that is a nice thing because I don't have to spend too much time on the chemical and molecular component of this because I know you'll get that in micro. So we get to do a little bit more uh, big picture, uh, top down uh, type of discussion and uh, talk about this kind of stuff. And then obviously, anytime we talk about the system, talking about immune disorders and immunodeficiencies is something that is important. And that's where you come in. Your group presentations kind of fall into that category as well as some lymphatic disorders as well, because we don't want to forget about that part of the section. All right. Um, again, as we've talked about many times in this class, uh, there are a tremendous number of uh, either beneficial or benign microorganisms. We've talked before about how a single centimeter of your skin can have as much as 10,000 different bacteria on the surface of those. Uh, of course, when I say that, people want to go diving for their Purell, but why is that not necessarily the best thing to do in those situations? This microphone is on, right? I am talking out loud. It's not just in my head. I do that sometimes, so I just want to make sure. You can kill the good bacteria. Right, exactly. They're, they are beneficial. Those 10,000 uh, um, uh, bacteria on your, on your skin outcompete harmful ones that try to come and take purchase. So when we talk about harmful things, we're not really so much talking about microorganisms. We're talking about pathogens. Pathogen is a microorganism uh, that is responsible for causing some type of cell death or some type of disease or disorder. And of course, what are the two most common types of pathogens? Bacteria and virus. Yeah, bacteria and viruses, absolutely. The most common of these are bacteria and viruses. Like I said, I know you'll get this in much more detail in micro, so I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about this, uh, but let's briefly talk about bacteria. By bacteria are of course prokaryotes, meaning they don't have a nucleus, they don't have organelles. In fact, they are the most simplistic organisms on the planet. However, right, despite their simplicity, and they're simple in shape, where they have uh, either typically rod or sphere or corkscrew uh, cork shapes to them. Uh, many of the harmful pathogen ones are associated with disease, but even that can be tricky. Like E. coli, what would you say right now if I told you that every single person in this class is currently infected with E. coli? Would anybody be surprised by that? No, because where do you know that E. coli is located? The distal part of the large intestine? Yeah, within your large intestine, absolutely. It's when it gets out of that large intestine and into other areas where it causes problems and things along those lines. So again, uh, botulinum is another example of a bacteria. Where do you typically find that? Botox. True, that is where you find it more and more these days. You find it in your plastic surgeon's office, right? But where did it originally start? Where were you if you were in the 1930s likely to find botulinum? Yeah, improperly canned foods, exactly. Canned foods that were improperly or, or spoiled, things along those lines. Uh, botulinum toxin breaks one of those proteins that leads to exocytosis uh, in your somatic motor neurons, uh, meaning that uh, your neurons cannot communicate and we leads to uh, things like uh, flaccid muscles, which of course we've taken advantage of to you know, get rid of those pesky wrinkles on our forehead, right? Or you inject it into the sweat glands in your armpit so that they can't release their sweat. Uh, so you don't have the stinky armpits and, and all sorts of other cosmetic reasons that we use that. And it's not all just cosmetic either. Uh, botulinum has been found to be successful with some types of migraines. Uh, they inject into the blood vessels, leading to the dilation of the smooth muscle there, uh, and that increase in blood flow. For some people, some of their migraines are brought on by decrease in blood flow in those superficial uh, cranial blood vessels. So again, it, it, it can definitely be uh, beneficial as well as uh, not just being uh, cosmetic in form. 
However, probably the most successful bacteria in the history of the planet is Yersinia pestis. Anyone know what that is? Let me rephrase that. Uh, you all know what that is. Anybody recognize what it is? Yersinia pestis is what is responsible for what we commonly refer to as the Black Plague. Right? In the history of mankind, since the onset of agriculture, when mankind stopped being hunters and gatherers and planted foods and stayed in one location, uh, there has been a steady increase in human population, right? In fact, it has become almost logarithmic in the rate at which our, uh, our births outpace our deaths. Only twice in the history of mankind has the rate of death uh, been greater than the rate of birth since the onset of agriculture. And both of those times, it was caused by Yersinia pestis, the Black Plague, right? Even as we hit that gruesome milestone of half a million people being dead in the US from COVID, birth rates are still outpacing it. So Yersinia pestis is the only time in the history of mankind since the onset of agriculture where we've had more deaths than births going on, where population has actually decreased. Again, for being simplistic, it is the most effective organism on the planet. Like I said, five times 10 to the 30 bacteria on the surface of the earth, which is a number that quite frankly, I can't even visualize. So like I said, uh, what uh, makes it a little bit easier for me to digest is to think of the fact that I have you know, one to 10,000 bacteria in a single square centimeter of skin, right? All those angels dancing on the head of pins and it's still you know, boggling the mind. And when we talk about numbers like that, all right, like I said, I'm, uh, we can go on for a long time talking about bacteria. And of course, if you take micro, especially if you take it with Janet, she will. She likes her little microorganisms. Um, Hanstead, who's an amazing instructor, I might point out. Um, one of the few on par with me. Excellent. Uh, viruses, as we have come to know and love over the past year, are our smallest known infectious agents, only about a hundredth of the size of the bacteria. And they can be incredibly simplistic. As you see from these illustrations, as we've learned from the coronavirus, basically they have two components to them. They have some type of genetic material. That genetic material can either be uh, DNA or it can actually be RNA bundled up inside of it. And then it is surrounded by some type of protein coat that allows it to be able to attach to, bind to, and insert that genetic material into a cell. As you can see, some of these protein uh, structures can be quite elaborate, or they can simply be globular. And this one, notice this retrovirus looks very much like the coronavirus with all those spikes that we have coming off of it. When you take micro, one of the huge debates people have is as to whether or not viruses are alive. If you think back to a general biology class, we talk about all the characteristics that are necessary to tell that that broccoli is alive and that uh, rock isn't. Things like metabolism, things like responding to their environment, things like growth, things like metabolism. And viruses by themselves don't do any of those things. However, when they inject themselves into a host cell, then they do actually do many of these components. So like I said, you can have that great philosophical debate in micro as to whether or not viruses are alive or not. What we care about is what those viruses do. Uh, some examples of those are things like the AIDS virus, rabies, hepatitis, colds, uh, warts, COVID-19. All of these are examples of viruses that we have had to deal with and are dealing with currently. And they're responsible for most of the uh, illnesses uh, that we think of when we think of people having like a cold or things along those lines. Now, again, as we have learned and as we are learning more and more about, uh, the health risks of a pathogen uh, is dependent primarily on three main factors, right? Because not all pathogens are equally dangerous. The first characteristic that determines how dangerous a pathogen actually is, is first the mode of transmission. How is it transferred from one person to another? 
right? Uh, is this something that has to be exchanged through bodily fluids? Is this something that has to be exchanged through the, you know, from blood to blood contact? Is this something that can be aerosolized and passed through the air, right? Uh, these types of things. This determines and is related to, but it's also separate from its transmittability, how easily it is passed from one person to another, right? If it's an exchange of bodily fluids like mucus, right, that would be its mode of transmission, but whether or not it is aerosolized, where it'd be easier to get in through for something like your eyeballs or from being breathed, breathed in, or whether or not it is in large globlets uh, where someone would have to directly sneeze on you, right? If someone sneezes on their hand and touches the doorknob, how long can it live on that innate surface, right? These types of things. So obviously mode of transmission and transmittability are related to each other. Uh, but uh, they are separate characteristics. And this was one of the concerns and is still one of the concerns uh, about COVID, for instance. How exactly is it? For the longest time, it was thought that it was the large droplets. We know it is transferred uh, from uh, fluid to fluid in humans. However, can it be aerosolized or, or not, right? There's a lot of research that shows that it can be aerosolized. And, and, and so then that becomes a concern with things like the nursing homes where you've got centralized air and things along those lines. Uh, the differences, uh, again, my daughter is in band. So one of the concerns is uh, can they're blowing, uh, singing in the church, absolutely. Playing music through a musical instrument where you're blowing air through a musical instrument. Uh, is that, what is the transmittability related to things like that. So there's a tremendous amount of research going on uh, with this transmittability associated with, uh, again, the associated risks associated with that. And then, of course, the third factor is the virulence. How much damage can it cause uh, once that affection occurs? All right, and this is one of the big concerns that we're seeing with these new variants. Some of these new variants, like for instance, it appears that the UK variant uh, is something that is, um, has a easier mode of transmission or it has a higher rate of transmittability, but they're still debating whether or not it has, uh, can cause more damage as a result of that. Right? I'm guessing every single person here in the class has been affected at one point or another in their life by a cold virus, maybe even the flu virus, right? But the virulence for that is relatively low. So while those have a high rate of transmittability, the damage that they cause to an individual when infected, right, where they feel most people, again, assuming they're not immune compromised, feel miserable for a day or, you know, for a, a week or so, and then get over it. Whereas something like Ebola, right? Ebola has a mortality rate of basically 80% in less than two weeks, right? It is incredibly virulent, incredibly damaging. However, the nice thing about Ebola, if there is a nice thing about Ebola, is that it requires blood uh, 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 for uh, transmission requires blood to blood contact. So it makes it much less likely that it is transmitted, right? Any good um, biological horror movie like uh, oh God, what was the one with the monkey and uh, Dustin Hoffman? I can't think of the name of that. Outbreak. Outbreak, absolutely. A lot of those types of movies involve a mutation to the Ebola virus that it suddenly becomes airborne. Its mode of transmission changes, allowing it to be much more transmittable, but it is still equally virulent. Right. And so, again, that's one of the things that we're looking at is but not just the mode of transmission, but the virulence of uh, things like the UK variation and the South African variation and all of these different variations we're now seeing of COVID as well. So, again, these three factors have to be taken into effect to determine how dangerous a pathogen is. All right, so like I said, that is a nickel tour through a whole semester of microbiology. But again, it gives us a good starting point to under, get a, even a general understanding of what we're up against, because then that helps us to understand how our body is going to defend itself. If we have a general understanding of what type of things are going to harm us, then we can understand of what type of defenses we need to protect ourselves. Now, when we talk about our body defenses, they kind of fall into two categories. Those two categories are our nonspecific or innate defenses, right? These are kind of what I like to think of in terms of our hammer defense. 
right? A hammer is an incredibly useful tool that can be used quickly, right? And indiscriminately. You have a nail you need to put in a wall, grab a hammer. You have a screw that needs to get into the wall, grab a hammer. You have a picture that is slightly uh, crooked on the wall, grab the hammer, right? You have a kid who's talking back to you, grab the hammer, right? It doesn't matter what the problem is, the hammer can solve it, right? You don't have to think, you just grab that one tool and it allows you to respond immediately. So these are our non-specific or what we call our innate defenses. And it's fast, but like I said, it's not precise, just like that hammer. However, we also have our scalpel defense. And with our scalpel defense, it's what we call a specific or adaptive defense system. Not only does our specific defense care whether it is a virus or a bacteria, but it cares whether it's virus A versus virus B. Right? That scalpel allows for tremendous precision. And that precision makes it very, very powerful. Right? So it can be specific to just one unique invader. The problem with that is it takes a bit of time. So it's not as fast, but it's much more precise than what we see with our non-specific defenses. And typically our specific or adaptive defenses is what we refer to as our immune response. Again, remember, we do not have an immune system. We have an immune response, cellular and chemical interactions that take place to provide some specific body defenses. So, we have these two intrinsic defense systems, but as we also talked about, and hopefully you spent some time this weekend looking at, as I mentioned, you've got that great uh, interactive physiology. And again, even though I didn't assign it, I assume everybody's taken the time to look at that. I'm sure you've all done that and spent hours on that. Uh, but it does this great job of talking about our body defenses and our defense mechanisms that are in place and it, of defending a castle. And when we're defending that castle, we really have three lines of defense. So when we think of these three lines of defense, oops, oh, hey, there you go, got it written there. The first of these, the goal of the first of these is to keep the pathogen out. If we can keep that pathogen out, right, our first line of defense keeps that pathogen out, then we don't have to worry about it. All the horrible things in the world can be out here in space, but it's not going to affect me. Of course, if it does break through and get into my body, then I've got my second line of defense. And that goal of the second line of defense is twofold. We want to limit the spread and limit the damage. Limit the spread and limit the damage that that harmful pathogen can uh, produce. And again, both of these first two lines of defense, keeping things out and limiting the spread, limiting the damage, both are part of that innate defense. Again, they don't care whether it's virus A, virus B, bacteria, uh, uh, you know, a parasitic worm, whatever it is, they affect and influence it the same way. However, we also have that precise scalpel third line of defense our adaptive defense. This is the one that is going to, uh, the goal of this one is to specifically target the pathogen. And one of the most important parts of this specific goal is not only does it help us to protect ourselves from it this time, but this produces the memory to stop future infections. I know there was a U in there somewhere I lost. There we go. If 
reduce memory to stop future invasions. And that is our third line of defense. So I think it's useful when we're talking about protection of our body, our body defenses, to think in terms of these three lines of defenses with these three uh, distinct and specific goals. So let's go through these. Starting with our first line of defense, with that goal of pre uh, preventing in entry of the pathogen. So give me an example of a part of our first line of defense, something that helps to limit uh, the movement of substances that are harmful into our body. Skin. Skin, absolutely. How? Let's be more precise. You are 100% absolutely correct. Skin is a huge part of our first line of defense. But let's be more specific. What are the characteristics of the skin that actually help to make it that big line of defense? Impermeable. Okay, why is it impermeable? Uh, keratinized, stratified, squamous epithelium. Absolutely, the tissue type. It is a keratinized, stratified, squamous epithelial tissue. Epithelium, excellent. So there are a couple of characteristics about that. Uh, stratified, so many layers, right? Uh, keratinized, it has that tough fibrous keratin. And that keratin, and remember also those lamellar granules that basically waterproof and make it that hard barrier, keeping things out. What else do we know about our skin? Well, I mentioned some of it earlier. Is it perfectly sterile on the environment of our skin? No, we, we, we have that resident bacteria that huge population of bacteria that is on the surface of our body, that's job is basically it's benign. It doesn't hurt us. And the way it helps us is that if a harmful bacteria comes and tries to find surface purchase on the surface of our body, it can outperform the harmful bacteria and stop it from making purchase. But what happens if a harmful bacteria does make purchase on this one uh, keratinocyte I have on the surface of my skin? What do I know is going to happen to that keratinocyte on the surface of my skin? It'll slough off. Yeah, exactly. Right? We are constantly shedding uh, the outer layer. So even if a harmful bacteria does make purchase, if I slough off that cell, it's no longer attached to me. And uh, so by constantly replenishing it, we are able to uh, protect ourselves from those harmful bacteria. Excellent. What else? I can think of at least two more things that help us with the skin. What else about the skin helps to keep harmful things away? Okay, and where do those antibacterial enzymes come from? How do they get on the surface of the skin? You're 100% correct, Ro, but how do they get, where do they come from? They don't just spontaneously appear. Where do they come from? Sweat. Say again? From the sweat. Yeah, exactly. Glandular secretions. And by that, I do mean secretions, plural. Both the sebum has an antibacterial component and our sweat has an antibacterial component, right? It also is acidic, right? So that again, we have that acid mantle on the surface of our skin, those glandular secretions, the shedding, absolutely. So our skin helps to form that uh, impenetrable barrier. 
it's one of the catch 22s of this whole uh, situation. We are constantly, constantly washing our hands to protect ourselves from those harmful pathogens. But when we do that, not only are we washing off the uh, resident bacteria that are there, making it more of an even playing ground for those harmful bacteria, but we're also drying out our skin. And when we dry out our skin, uh, that then can lead to cracking uh, and loss of that impenetrable thick barrier right, that we have. Now, again, I'm not encouraging anybody not to wash their hands all the time. I'm just saying that you also need to probably moisturize or things along those lines as well. Awesome. So our skin does a whole heck of a lot for us, but we have others as well. Give me more. What are some other examples of some nonspecific first line of defenses that keep things out? Mucous membranes. Excellent. We have our mucous membranes, which of course do what? Not a trick question. What does a mucous membrane do? It's mucus. Saliva and mucus. Yeah, they make mucus. Well, don't jump ahead. You're right on that one. Let's start with, let's stick with mucus first. They make mucus, absolutely. Mucus captures dust and debris, All right? Harmful pathogens in there. You mentioned saliva. Yes, saliva has mucus in it, but it also has serious fluid. It also has uh, antibacterial uh, enzymes in it, like lysozymes. Not lysosomes. Remember, lysosomes are that organelle inside of a cell, lysozymes. Anything else that might have uh, lysozymes in it besides our saliva? There you go, Christopher's got it. Also, you gotta figure anytime there's a list of things, anytime there's a process with steps, those are all excellent essay questions. What else besides saliva and mucus might have uh, antibacterial enzymes in them? Tears? I was going to say, yeah, many of you are familiar with these because you shed them after the first exam. Excellent, right? Tears. Absolutely, we're producing those tears, right? With that mucus, right? It captures that dust and debris. And then what does it do with it? Yeah, that nasal cavity producing mucus. And then where does it go? It goes out. Okay, it can dribble out of, my, out of my nose on my face. Or where else could it go? Into your digestive tract. Right, and why would we want to necessarily have it in our digestive tract? Stomach acid kills. There you go, absolutely, stomach acid. Right. That acidity of the stomach is vitally important. We talked about the acidity of the skin. What else is acidic? Sweat is acidic. Stomach is acidic. Doesn't your saliva have a slight acidity? Yeah, so stomach's acidic. Um, again, saliva can be acidic. Urine? Urine. All right. Again, remember, we talked about mucous membranes. What are the organ systems that are lined with mucous membranes? Respiratory. GI and urinary. Yes, and sorry, digestive, urinary, you're missing one. Reproductive. Reproductive, there you go. Think of those four systems, right? Digestive and, and uh, respiratory both produce mucus, right? We have the acid in the stomach, right? Our urinary system has urine that passes through it, which is very, very acidic, right? Uh, think of the lining of the walls of these. Many of them are that keratinized stratified squamous a non keratinized sorry. Epithelium. Uh, like our oral cavity, like our anus, like the distal part of the urethra, like the vaginal canal, right? All of these. And one of my all time favorite things to say in this class is that the vagina is an incredibly hostile environment. Right? Why is that important? It 
as it's exposed to the outside world? Yeah, absolutely. Not only is it exposed to the outside world, but one of the important factors that we're going to be talking about when we get to the reproductive system is that the male's reproductive system is a closed system. Basically, it is a one-way path from the testes out of the body. However, the female's reproductive system is an open system. Their vaginal canal, which leads into the uterus, which leads into the uterine tubes, leads into the abdominal pelvic cavity of a female. It's one of the reasons why sexually transmitted diseases are so much more of a concern in females than they are in males. Because in males, they pretty much can only affect the reproductive system. Once some type of harmful pathogen gets into the abdominal pelvic cavity, it can affect any of the organs in that abdominal pelvic cavity. So the vagina produces mucus. The vagina has a very acidic mantle to it. Uh, to again, there's the the the, um, uh, the uh, mucus plug uh, to the uterus to help to limit exposure to the outside world uh, to the female's abdominal pelvic cavity. Again, remember, we'll talk about this a lot when we get to the reproductive system. But when the female is born, is her reproductive system functioning? Is it needed? Is it useful for the first? 12, 13, 14 years of her life? No. no, it's not even functional at that point yet. And it is still an opening into their abdominal pelvic cavity. So having protections in place in there are vitally, vitally important. Like I said, tremendously fun to say that the, the vagina is a hostile environment, but it is vitally important that it be that to provide that protection uh, for the female because it is so important to provide that protection. So absolutely, uh, the, the acid mantle and the, and the mucus of the vaginal canal are, again, all great examples of these first line of defenses, right? If you think about it, these are the openings, the conjunctiva of the eye, the nasal cavity, the oral cavity, the digestive cavity, you know, all of these that are open to the outside world are things. And then of course the outside is protected by our skin. Excellent. I think we've gotten everything I could think of off the top of my head. Am I missing anything? I don't think I have. Can anybody think of any other types of first line defenses, things that stop uh, harmful things? Oh, I got one more. In our saliva, not only do we have those antibacterial enzymes, lysozymes, at least the acidity of the saliva, it's slightly acidic. Well, they're not much. It's really about seven. It's not very acidic in the oral cavity. But one of the things we do have is antibodies in our body secretions. So that means saliva. Uh, that can mean some sweat. Uh, breast milk, has antibodies in it so that mom can provide some passive immunity to the baby, things along those lines as well. And again, notice none of these things care what the pathogen is, right? The skin is an impenetrable barrier, whether it is a virus, a bacteria, right? A parasitic worm, whatever it is, it doesn't care. The acid doesn't care what it's dissolving. The mucus doesn't care what it's capturing. None of these things require any type of identification. Earwax, excellent. Oh, that's another great one. Of course, we should use the appropriate anatomical term for it. Uh, so uh, definitely bonus points for coming up with earwax, but what was the correct anatomical term for earwax again? Anyone remember? Mm. Cerumen, there you go. Excellent. <laughs> Spectacular. Cerumen, absolutely. The ceruminous glands in our ear produce that cerumen. Spectacular. Excellent. Another great example, right? Think of the openings of your body to the outside world and the things that are made there to provide that protection to keep bad things out. Spectacular. Excellent, excellent, excellent. All right. So again, uh, I don't have the list of them here, but uh, we just did that. So we'll go through again. They all kind of fall into one of a couple categories, either some type of mechanical barrier where they're physically keeping the thing up or capturing it or bundling it away, or some type of chemical barrier, right? An acid that denatures the proteins, right? A lysozyme that is an antibacterial enzyme that breaks down bacteria. Uh, defensins, uh, antibacterial pe uh, peptides, uh, we talked about the antibodies, all of those types of things. So Ben, all of our first line of defenses kind of fall into one of these two categories, either a mechanical barrier, many cell layers, hardened dead cells, right? So on and so forth, or some type of chemical barrier.
And we came up with a great list of a ton of stuff. Excellent. All right. So that is our first line of defense. Very simple, very straightforward, big hammer to provide some protection. And it is very, very good at its job. But it's not perfect. And unfortunately, because it's not perfect, sometimes bad things get in. And so when those bad things get in, wow. um, luckily we have other defenses. And our next defense, our second line of defense, which again, remember is also nonspecific, uh, job is twofold. We want to limit the spread through the body and we want to um, limit the damage it can do. Again, I have to work on my analogies because normally we're sitting in the classroom together. And so while we're sitting in the classroom, I mentioned about how we're in this classroom with these big solid concrete walls. And so we are mostly protected. But unfortunately there are the two doors in the classroom and something harmful can come in that door. Right. So again, back in ancient times, when the worst things that we had to worry about in the classroom was a, a you know, uh, some kind of maniac running around with a gun, right, where we have those active shooter drills, right, one of the things they talk about is first thing, bar the doors so that they can't come in. But if someone does come in, right, we're going to luckily have some defenders on the inside, we're going to have guards to protect us. And as we talked about in the last class, if I have guards in the classroom, 10 guards to protect us in the classroom, am I gonna evenly spread them, distribute them around the entire circumference of the room? No, if we have two doors, I'm gonna put five by one door and five by the other door. And if that active shooter comes in the door, those five guys are gonna to try to grab him, try to grab his arms, grab his hands, get him to the ground right? Limit his ability to get further into the classroom, limit his ability to do damage. And that's what our second line of defense is about. Limiting the spread and limiting the damage that can be do, can be do, can be done. There are several examples of these, some things that we've already talked about, like our phagocytes. We've talked a little bit about phagocytes. We'll talk more about their function and their activation. Uh, we have cellular uh, immunological surveillance. These are the night watchmen that run around our body looking for harmful things. We have uh, antimicrobial and chemical proteins. Uh, so it isn't all cell cellular. We also have uh, chemicals and proteins that are dissolved in the plasma, which of course means they get into the interstitial fluid and spread around that are gonna provide some protection. And then of course we have physiological processes like inflammation and fever. All of these play a very important role in helping us to uh, protect and defend ourselves, uh, forming that second line of defense so that if something gets in, we limit the spread and we limit the damage that it can cause. All right, let's go through these and talk about these starting first with something we're vaguely familiar with, and those are our phagocytes. While many of our leukocytes have phagolytic properties, what were the two main types of leukocytes that we said uh, were responsible for becoming phagocytes in the body? Neutrophils and macrophages. There you go. Neutrophils, uh, which became our phagocytes when activated. Those were our first responders, of course. And the others were our monocytes, which when activated, when leaving the blood supply, uh, became what? Macrocytes. Oh, great, exactly. Well, macrophages are big eaters. Macrophage, right? Macro big, phages, big eaters. Absolutely. So the neutrophils, of course, were our first responders. Monocytes are more involved with long-term or more chronic types of infections. So obviously we're gonna focus primarily on the neutrophils, but both of these are mobilized in a similar fashion. Now, when we talk about the mobilization, here we see an example of an injury, 
right? You prick yourself with a needle or a nail or whatever that is in through the surface of your epidermis and dermis, damaging the surface of your skin. As you can see, when this occurs, the damaged tissue is going to release chemical signals. These chemical signals are then going to migrate into, diffuse into the blood, where it will then spread throughout the body. Remember, one of the things we talked about with our leukocytes is that only about 2% are in circulation. The rest instead are housed in locations like the bone marrow, housed in locations like the lymph nodes, right? Locations like that, spleen, liver, uh, places like that. So the first thing we need to do is we need to mobilize those defenses, those uh, phagocytes to come and help to protect us. So those chemical signals that are released are going to stimulate are neutrophils to exit the bone marrow, exit the lymph node, enter into the blood capillary and start moving around inside the body. Now, of course, the type, there are lots of different types of chemical signals that can do this, but most of them fall into a class of hormones or class of chemical signals, I should say. They're not hormones, but a class of chemical signals called leukocyte-inducing factors. So these leukocyte-inducing factors stimulate the neutrophils to exit the bone marrow, to exit uh, the lymph node, to exit the spleen, to exit the liver, and enter into the blood supply. And that process is leukocytosis. That's a hormone, you said? No, it is a protein. It is a, it is a, it is a, it is a hormone-like protein. It's not actually a hormone. just a chemical signal. Now, as we know, once that neutrophil gets into the blood supply, it can literally go everywhere in the body. We don't want it to go everywhere in the body. We want it to go to the site of the uh, injury. Now, luckily, the chemical signals are gonna be strongest in the area where the injury is. And so that increase in the chemical gradient is going to cause that neutrophil, when it gets near the site of the injury, it is gonna cause it to become sticky. And it's actually going to attach itself to the endothelium of our capillary wall. So that chemical signal, those inducing factors causes the uh, neutrophil to stop circulating and to attach to the plasma membrane of our endothelium in a process we call margination. Now, assuming this is someplace in the skin, as we've seen, we know that this is going to contain con con continuous capillaries which have a completely intact epithelium. But remember that epithelium has those intercellular clefts, those small spaces in between of those epithelial cells that allows that movement of fluid and materials in and out of the capillary. And what our neutrophil is able to do is it is able to actually squeeze its way through those intercellular clefts in a process we call diapetesis. With diapetesis, our uh, neutrophil squeezes through that intracellular cleft. Of that capillary. And it enters the interstitial fluid. And of course, as we know, once it leaves the blood supply, once it enters into the interstitial fluid, we consider it to be active. And that active neutrophil, we now call a phagocyte. Now, 
Now, that phagocyte is going to eat things. Do we want it just eating any old thing? Just randomly pick something and gobble it up? No. So once it gets out into the interstitial fluid, we want to make sure that that phagocyte is going to the site of the injury. And once again, we are going to use chemical signals to do this. Healthy tissue is going to produce an inhibitory chemical signal that is going to deter the phagocyte from coming to that region. Whereas the injured tissue is going to be producing attracting chemical signals that are going to encourage the phagocyte to come to that region. So notice we are going to use both positive attractive chemical signals and negative repelling chemical signals to direct the phagocyte exactly where we want it to go. And that use of chemical signals to direct the phagocyte where we want it is the process we call chemotaxis. So in this fashion, we can pull that neutrophil out of the bone marrow and get it to the site of the injury where it can now do its job. All right, any questions on how we get the phagocyte to its location to do its job? And again, this is the process of phagocytic mobilization. We are mobilizing them because remember, only 2% in a normal healthy individual, only 2% are in circulation. So when we have an injury, we've got to get those phagocytes there. Um, can you repeat the healthy tissue releases negative chemotaxis? Yeah, the chemical signals that are going to repel the phagocyte, to keep the phagocyte from going to that area. So if you think about it, if a phagocyte was sitting right here and over here to the right, it's this tissue, this damaged tissue is producing a signal that attracts it. And over here to the left, this healthy tissue is producing a chemical signal that repels it. Well, is this cell equally likely to go left or right? No, it's gonna go away from the chemical signal that repels it and towards the chemical signal that attracts it. So in this fashion, once we get that phagocyte into the interstitial fluid, we can direct it to the location where it's needed and not just have it randomly start gobbling things up. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. All right, great question. Any others? All right, now we've gotten our phagocyte to the site of the injury. Let's talk about what it is going to do. A phagocyte, phagocytosis, right? So let's talk about the events of phagocytosis. Here's the pretty picture of our textbook. And again, we're primarily talking about neutrophils. They're our first responders, but our monocytes work the same way. Obviously the first thing we have to do is to attach to something that doesn't belong. Something, and let's use the term abnormal. When I say something abnormal, this obviously is going to be that pathogen, but it could also be dead and or damaged uh, cells, right? It could also be uh, abnormal cells like cancer cells or transplanted cells, right? You just can't randomly pick some liver up off the street and stick it in your body, right? We talked about how if you're AB positive, you can pick up just any random blood you find on the street and stick it in your body. 
But remember, we talked about how blood has two antigens that cause a severe reaction, right? And so as long as you have the ABO antigen correct, as long as you have the RH factor correct, then you can play matchy-matchy. Well, to stick a liver in someone's body, a liver actually has closer to 30 antigens that cause a severe reaction. Over 200 different antigens on the surface of those liver cells. So if the liver cells aren't exactly 100% right, they may be expressing stuff on the surface of their bodies that that macrophage may identify as foreign and attack. So there are two ways that we can attach to these things. Let me grab this. Uh, the first, of course, is by the phagocyte recognizing a, a, an, a not us, let's use the term not us, antigen on the surface. But there's another way we can make it even easier for a phagocyte to recognize something that's not there. If only there was a way to like plant a flag on a cell to have that flag wave around and say, hey, I don't belong here, do something about me. Do we have flags like that we can plant on cells? Well, I'm asking yeah. the question, what's the obvious answer? Yes. The obvious answer is yes. And what are those flags we can plant on the cells? Antibodies. Antibodies, absolutely. So if we come across something that is an antibody, that is an easy handle that that neutrophil, or really, again, at this point, it is a phagocyte, is able to attach to. So the first job, step one, is to attach to uh, something that doesn't belong. Something dead, something damaged, something foreign. Once it attaches to it, it is then going to fold its plasma membrane around that structure and bring it into the cell. Which is 100% completely accurate in describing what it does. However, do we have a fancy name for that process? Again, I'm asking the question. So the obvious endocytosis? answer. Endocytosis? Yeah, endocytosis, exactly. Endocytosis. It is going to endocytose that foreign material, bringing it inside. When it does that, it forms a structure we call a phagosome. which is essentially a vesicle. Now, we know we happen to have vesicle type organelles and one of the ones we talked about way back in 430 was a lysosome. Someone remind me again what a lysosome does? Digests material. Yeah, it contains a massive number of hydrolytic enzymes. Again, big fancy phrase, the kind of thing you can call grandma on the phone and say, hey, grandma, guess what? Your lysosomes contain hydrolytic enzymes and she seems very impressed and she'll send you 20 bucks in the mail. What do hydrolytic enzymes do again? Do they make and bonds or do they break bonds? Break, break it's a good bonds. guess. Hydrolytic. You've got the right idea. Hydro definitely involves water. But remember, hydrolytic, hydrolyse, means to use water to break bonds. Remember, we talked about way back in uh, 430, and I'll do this. If you've got a bond between two components that is being held together by a hydroxyl group, you can use water to come in here and split this. Oh, sorry, no, hold on. No, not a hydroxyl group, held together by an oxygen. Sorry, oops, didn't mean to do that. 
held together by an oxygen, then you can use water to come in here, break that bond. And when you break that bond, uh, it separates the bond and both of these get hydroxyl groups at the ends of them. Again, if you don't remember this, if this all sounds foreign or I go back to chapter three, uh, where they talked about uh, uh, chemistry and we'll talk about, and you can remember that uh, or to whatever chapter chemistry was in. Uh, but hydrolysis is that using of water to break a bond. So these break things up. That's what lysozymes do. So what happens is that free floating organelle, the lysosome binds to our phagosome. And of course, when it does that, it forms something fancy. One of those terms, you can, alphabet soup terms, you can guarantee with 100% certainty you're gonna have to spell at one point or another. When it binds the phagosome, it forms a phagolysosome. And basically releases those enzymes into the structure where it gobbles up and breaks down the pathogen, neutralizing it so that it's no longer functional. At this point, yeah, and don't forget proteins. It also breaks down proteins as well. So, and again, that's because again, that's what we're doing. We want to break down the proteins. We want to break down the nucleic acids. We want to destroy that pathogen, its virus, its protein coat, its DNA, all of the components of it. it breaks down the pathogen. At which point it's basically into building blocks. Once it's broken down into harmful amino acids, or harmful nucleic acids, those are things that can be used for uh, rebuilding our own things. At this point, it's just waste that can be recycled. And at that point, most of the destroyed material are released into the interstitial fluid. Now, first, why would we want to release this stuff into the interstitial fluid? So it can get picked up and done away with, or? Yeah, that it, well, at this point it's recycled material. So you're right, it could be picked up by cells and it could be used, but it also, by releasing parts of this harmful pathogen that are harmless, it can allow our immune cells to recognize that harmful thing. So by releasing it, it can also help to stimulate an immune response, increasing inflammation in the area, increasing fever, causing things along those lines. But what was the key word in that? Most of the material is released. What does that mean? What does Some most is mean? Not. Some is not, exactly. So the other thing that the phagocyte does is to express some of that material on its surface. And this plays a hugely vital role in uh, stimulating our immune response. Right? Yes, it's great when you and your castle kill that thief, but it's even better when you take the head of that thief and stick it on a stake outside your castle. Because A, it's then a warning to others not to come, but it also lets the people in town know, hey, there are bad people around. I need to be on the lookout for them. So this expression of it on the surface makes it a very important for stimulating our immune response. In fact, these pathogens, uh, pardon me, these phagocytes we call antigen presenting cells because of this job of 
presenting that, look what I just gobbled up. That means these things are around and it stimulates our immune response. All right, questions on that. All right, excellent. We have then in our second line of defense, talked about phagocytes, talked about how we mobilize our phagocytes, talked about how we underwent the process of phagocytosis. And again, to answer the question that hasn't been asked, but I'm sure you're thinking in the back of your mind, are these things that make good essay questions? Yes, of course. Anything that has steps in it makes good essay questions. But as I will also remind you, make sure you read the questions carefully. These are two different essay questions. If I ask you for the events of phagocytosis, don't tell me about uh, you know, leukocytosis and marginization and diapetosis and chemotaxis, right? Because that's mobilization. If you're telling me about mobilization, I don't wanna be hearing about phagolysosomes. Right, so make sure you answer the correct question. These are two different essay questions. Uh, make sure you recognize which one I am asking if I ask one of these. All right, questions on that. I think we did a good job, but again, there's all the pretty pictures uh, and there's a brief outline talking about what we did as well. All right, I think this is a good uh, stopping point. We still have some more of our second line of defense to go, but as I mentioned, we got a lot of lecture to do today, so this is a good stopping point. Let's go ahead and take our first break at this point. Uh, I'll take a 15-minute break, so we will restart at, uh, looks like, 9.32, and we'll start the recording at that time. All right, any questions? All right, see you guys in 15 minutes. Let me answer uh, Laura's question now that we're back from the break uh, about the histology for the lymphatic system. I think we went over some of it uh, through the uh, lecture. So I would go back and look at the lecture from that. Uh, but it looks like you're responsible for, if I'm trying to remember correctly, because um, I, I don't have the handout in front of me, uh, you need to know a lymph node histologically. Uh, the spleen histologically, the tonsils histologically, and um, I feel like there's one more. Oh, the pyrus patches uh, histologically. So those are things that you should all be able to recognize under the microscope and the components of those. Uh, if we have time at the end of lecture, I like I said, I don't want to leave time for your group, but we can go over some of the histology then as well. If not, next week when we uh, get to the uh, um, endocrine system, we'll be doing a lot of histology, so that would be a time to bring it up as well. Okay, so those are the things that I think are on your list that you are responsible for, absolutely. And, uh, and we did go over that a little bit in lecture, but again, just with one slide. And so it's always easier when you have many to look at. Any other questions before we get started? All right, so we've talked about our phagocytes then. So let's talk about some of our other parts of our second line of defense. And again, remember the goal of this second line of defense is to uh, limit the spread and reduce the damage that is caused by it. Phagocytes are not the only cells that are involved in providing this second line of defense. Uh, we also have uh, what are primarily known as natural killer cells. These oh. are a special type of lymphocyte uh, we'll talk more about the lymphocytes when we get to our immune response. Our lymphocytes are the ones that are, are responsible for forming our B cells and T cells that we've talked about briefly, and we'll talk about more. But lymphocytes can also become natural killer cells. The B cells and T cells are part of the third line of defense. But our natural killer cells are part of the second line of defense. And these are the ones that I, I so uh, affectionately refer to as our security guards. I'd always think of them in, in, in terms of you're at a museum late at night. 
right? And you have, you know, that 80 year old guy with the big, huge, large flashlight that's wandering around, looking around the museum. And that's kind of what the natural killer cells do. Their job is to roam around the uh, body. And as they roam around the body, their job with their little flashlight is to look for things that don't belong. And if they find something that doesn't belong, they're going to destroy it. Now, unlike our old man security guard with the flashlight, these don't have a flashlight. So they're basically doing it by their hands. They're roaming around blindly, just feeling the things that are around them, looking for something that doesn't feel right. Primarily the way they find things that don't look right isn't by recognizing a foreign antigen. I say, this, hey, this thing doesn't belong but by finding an antigen that isn't an us antigen. Remember when we were talking about blood typing, we were talking about what are the antigens on the surface of our cells? What are the antibodies that we have in our body? Well, yeah. there are antigens on the surface of cells that all of our cells have that we are able to use to recognize them. So this guy goes around feeling for those antigens. And if he doesn't find it, then he knows this thing doesn't belong and he is capable of destroying it. Now, the way he destroys it can be a couple of ways, but the importance of this is remember, they're looking for that normal shaped protein. Obviously that can be a pathogen, something foreign that is there that doesn't belong. But if a cell is infected with a virus, that virus, remember, makes it make abnormal proteins. And so if this cell starts presenting abnormal proteins on the surface, it can recognize that infected cell and destroy it. Cancer cells typically make abnormal proteins. So again, the security guards can recognize those abnormal proteins and destroy that cancer cell. And again, those are definitely good things. But remember, we also talked about that liver transplant you got. And that's the problem as well. You decided to have vodka for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for 17 straight years. And as a result of that, you destroyed your liver. You've seen the light of the, your errors. Uh, you were able to get a transplant and they put a brand new liver in your body. The problem is the security guards don't recognize the cells. Hey, no, d during the COVID, uh, again, uh, my coffee is uh, also, I, you know, I'm there as well. <laughs> Um, um, but transplanted cells uh, can be a problem as well. So a lot of uh, transplant rejections start with these natural killer cells not recognizing this transplanted cell as something that is us and can, can start the defense against it and uh, ultimately lead to the rejection of this. Now, we'll talk more about how it functions because it functions in a similar way to the T cells, but there are primarily two things that these natural killer cells can do to destroy that foreign, that abnormal, that harmful cell. The first is that it can release proteins that form a pore in the plasma membrane. One of the things, <laughs> no, definitely not. Um, one of the things we learned way back in 430 is that how our plasma membrane is a semi-permeable barrier. So if you poke a hole by take proteins, put a pore in that <laughs> plasma membrane, then it's suddenly not semi-permeable anymore. It's just permeable. And if it's permeable, what's going to do? What's going to happen? I know you know. You poke a hole in the plasma membrane of a cell. What happens? And not just anything. Let's and not just stuff. You guys are absolutely correct. But let's be more specific. What sodium? Stuff? Sodium, absolutely. What wants in more than anything else? Sodium. Sodium has a huge driving force. And of course, where that stuff goes. As Allison pointed out, water is going to follow. So this cell causes the cell to swell. And if you like, just like a water balloon, if you fill it up too much, what is it going to do? 
it's gonna pop. burst. It's gonna pop, yeah. it's gonna lice. Absolutely, lice. so it can poke holes in the cells and cause them to fill up with water and sodium and burst. Or it can also trigger apoptosis. Someone remind me what apoptosis is? No yeah, it is a programmed cell death. Absolutely, Izzy's got it, absolutely. Basically, uh, it tells the cell to either destroy its DNA, and obviously if it, it destroys all of its nucleic acids, it can no longer make proteins, it can no longer repair, it can no longer cause any harm. Or in some cases, instead of breaking down its genetic material, it'll eject its nucleus, right? It basically undergoes this programmed cell death. And so using chemical signals, using proteins, it can uh, kill and destroy these unrecognized cells in one or both of these fashions. All right. Again, very useful, very powerful cells. But just like that museum, right, that museum can have many, many, many priceless artifacts inside of it. But, you know, on a good night, there are four security guards maybe roaming around, right? Two in the central room drinking their coffee, watching the monitors, and two roaming around the place, right? If an individual cat burglar gets in, they can definitely be useful that way if they can find them, right? Again, if you got the whole big museum and two guys looking and one guy playing hide and seek with them, they're not necessarily going to be that effective. And if instead of just one cat burglar coming in, you have a thousand cat burglars coming in, are those poor four security guards going to be much good by themselves? No. So again, it is a powerful process, but it is limited in the scope. And again, it's non-specific. It's just looking for me or not me. Not me, kill. Me, move along your way. Right? It doesn't care what the not me thing is. So this is part of our, again, these are using lymphocytes, but this is part of our second line of defense, part of our non-specific defenses. All right, excellent. We're not just reliant on cells either. Way back in at the beginning of 431, when we talked about blood, we talked about how there are massive amounts of proteins in our blood plasma. You looked at that pretty list in your textbook and then promptly forgot all about it, which is fine because it wasn't something that we emphasized. But one of the important types of proteins that are found inside of our blood plasma are what are known as complement proteins. There are actually over 20 different complement proteins that can be found inside of our blood plasma. Your book does this amazing job of describing the cascade effect by which these complement proteins work. And remind me again what I mean when I say a cascade effect. Like one thing leads to another. Yeah. yeah, it's a domino effect. I like that. One event leads to another, absolutely. So the first event occurs, which triggers the second, which triggers the third and triggers the first. One of the advantages of this type of a cascade effect, and this is a term we will definitely be talking about more uh, when we get to other systems, is a cascade effect with amplification. Uh, so that means that one event dropping one domino, yes, can hit a second domino, but it can also hit two dominoes, which then hit four dominoes, which then hit eight dominoes. Right, so we can get a much larger effect from a single stimulus with this as well. Like I said, your book does a great job of describing in intimate detail these processes, but in particular, what I'm interested in you understanding is that there are two main pathways by which the activation of these proteins occur. The first, as we see here in this illustration, is what is known as the classic pathway. All right, so I want you to take a look at this pretty picture for a second, but then we're gonna go to the whiteboard. I'm gonna draw this and simplify this a little bit to make sure that we understand. All right, so let's go now to our whiteboard.
here is our pathogen. All right. And as we know, pathogens are going to have some type of antigens on their surface. And we'll just make them triangles because they're easy for me to draw. And it looks spiky and dangerous that way. All right, make some cool. The spikes make everything look cool. Excellent. With the classic pathway, the key to the classic pathway is with the classic pathway, we need something to trigger the response. And in this case, that trigger, something that is going to facilitate and drive this pathway, this is a driven pathway, is that it starts with an antibody. We know antibodies because we've talked about them. We'll talk about them even more in the next class. But for now, we know that they are Y-shaped proteins that have some kind of a specific binding site on them, convenient enough to triangle shape for this now. And the stem of that Y, as we've talked about, is a big flag that gets waved in the air. Some spiked crocs, oh my. <laughs> Um, a flag that waves in the air that makes it easy for this things to attach to it. As we know, one of the things that can find that flag is our phagocyte. But the other thing that can find this flag is our first complement protein. Which conveniently enough is known as C1. And that first complement protein C1 binds to the antibody. So that antibody is present and C1 binds to it. This, as we've talked about, starts our cascade response. The binding of C1 activates uh, C2 and C2 along with C4 uh, is involved in this process. But the events of this cascade response and the part that we care about is it leads to the active splitting of C3, complement protein three. So complement protein three, which we'll just draw as a box here. Oops, I want that to be blue. is split. So again, we have the active, purposeful, driven splitting of C3 into C3A and C3B. Again, I don't care that you know it's by activating two, which then uh, co-uses C4 to do this, blah, blah, blah. I don't care about any of that. What I care is that it starts with the binding of C1 to the antibody, leading to the directed, the active process of splitting C3 into C3A and C3B. All right, if we go back to the pretty picture from your textbook for a second, Again, here we see the C1 complement protein binding to the antibodies. Again, we don't care about the mechanism. No, C2 and C4 are both involved in this process. And again, you don't need to know the process. The, your book does a great job of describing it. If you need to read it to make sense of it, then that's fine. I don't care. You do that but I'm not gonna hold you responsible for the actual mechanisms by which this occurs, all right? C2 is what actively splits it, but there's the coenzyme C4 that helps to activate it. I don't care about any of that. What we care about is it started with the binding of C1 to an antibody, and it leads to the splitting of C3 into two parts, C3A and C3B, okay? Why this is important is what these two parts do. C3B
binds to the pathogen. We'll talk about why that's important in just a second. And C3A becomes an active chemical signal in the humors of the body. So when split, C3B binds to the pathogen and C3A becomes an active chemical signal in the humors. This active chemical signal then can trigger or enhance our immune response. It can increase inflammation. It can attract, uh, it can be one of those attractive chemical signals, phagocytes, et cetera. C3B can be a binding site for phagocytes, making it easier for the phagocyte to grab onto the pathogen and gobble it up. But the other thing it will be, is it becomes a binding site for other um, complement proteins. So what will happen is other complement proteins, and I'll use circles for these, can come and bind to it as well. And when it binds to it, it may bind to another, which binds to another, which binds to another, and binds to another, and binds to another, and binds to another, and binds to another. And, binds to another. and lo and behold, all those proteins that have bound to each other basically form a pore in the plasma membrane. Oh, that didn't need to be all in caps. And of course, as we know, when you form a pore in the plasma membrane, what happens? It allows it to lyse. Yeah, salt and water fall inside and it causes the cell to lyse. These complement proteins that form a pore is what we call the MAC, right? They're the MAC complex. And they are going to play an important role in helping to destroy this pathogen. All right, questions on that? This is all the classic pathway where it's driven, it's active. Again, if this doesn't make sense, you need to let me know now because it's about to get worse. Um, the pore itself is the MAC complex? The proteins that form it are called the MAC complex. Okay. And I'll, I'll show you a picture of them. Again, you don't need to know which complement proteins form it, uh, but I will show it to you. But I want to talk about the alternate pathway first. Yeah, I'll take a screenshot of this and I'll upload it for review. But there are pictures in your textbook that are better. But I will do this as well. I'll happily do that. All right. Let's talk about the second pathway because there is the classic pathway, but there's also an alternate pathway. The alternate pathway is not driven. It is spontaneous. However, the one advantage to this process is it does not require antibodies. All right? The classic pathway is great very effective, but notice for it to work, there already has to be, oops, there already has to be an antibody for this pathogen and it needs to be connected to it. 
Excellent. Thank you, Nicholas. I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. There's pictures there and I'll show you some pictures from your textbook as well. So luckily there is a more uh, spontaneous process. And the reason for this is, as it turns out, three C, oh, pardon me, complement protein C3 is not very stable. It will actually spontaneously come apart. Right. So here's my three complement three C3 complement protein where it will just separate and then it can go back together and it can separate and it can go back together and it can separate and it can go back together and it will just do this spontaneously. So spontaneously it can come apart and then reform. And so that's what it does. It comes apart and then it goes back together and it comes apart and then it's able to go back together and it comes apart and it's able to go back together. But what happens if when it comes apart, there just happens to be a pathogen present? Then what could happen is my C3B that has been separated can actually attach to that pathogen. And if it attaches to the pathogen, is it going to be able to go back together? No. And so now we'll have CB3 bound to my pathogen and C3A floating around in the fluid as that active chemical signal. So again, notice we didn't purposely bring it apart. We didn't purposely break it saying, hey, there's something bad here, we need to break you apart. But it's something that happens spontaneously. And if it happens to spontaneously happen when there's a pathogen present, then RC3B can bind to the pathogen. So in this case, we have our C3, which is spontaneously breaking into the two parts. So again, this is C3, this is C3A, this is C3B. And if this just happens to happen when there's a pathogen present, oops. I hate this whiteboard. Then what can happen? is again, this can bind, this becomes free floating, and we get the same effect. So again, we're gonna get the same effect, but this one happened spontaneously, essentially by accident, because it just happened to split when the pathogen was present. Whereas the classic pathway, it's purposeful, it's driven. But whether it's purposeful or driven, whether it's spontaneous, the end result is the same. C3B is bound to the pathogen and C3A becomes that chemical signal. All right, let me save this so that I don't forget to do that. And then we can come back to the pretty pictures from your textbook. So here we see the driven with complement protein one binding to the antibodies, but it leads to C3B being bound to the pathogen. The alternate pathway, spontaneously it breaks apart, doesn't need the antibodies, doesn't need C1, but the result is the same. C3B binds to the antigen. And is there any way that it, the pathogen can bind to C3A instead of C3B? No. no. No, C3B is the one that has this special binding site for it. So it's the two parts, right? One's got the tab, one's got the slot. They go together on their own, but the tab of one can also attach to a pathogen. Got it. And again, notice C3B can be a flag to let that, ant, that, ant, that phagocyte know to come and gobble it up, but it also can stimulate this membrane attack complex, what we call that MAC attack, 
that is going to poke a hole in the cell and cause the cell to be uh, 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 lysed. Um, I'm not familiar with lectin to know whether it's a part of either of these, so I'm afraid I can't answer that question. Again, not my area of expertise. Uh, I, I'm not sure where, what role lectin plays in this or if it plays a role in a different pathway or different process. This is, a, this is just an example of one of our antimicrobial chemicals. I don't recall if lectin is a complement protein or not. Sorry. So let's talk about what it can do. Again, uh, influences innate and adaptive processes. C3A becomes that active stimulus, uh, stimulating inflammation, right? They can attack phagocytes to the area and make it easier for that phagocyte to bind. So it enhances the phagocytosis, attracts the phagocytes, uh, and forms that pore in the plasma membrane with that membrane attack complex. And like I said, and as you guys have already looked at, your book's got the pretty picture that kind of shows this uh, pathway. Again, whether C3 is uh, purposely or spontaneously split, uh, again, coats the surface. Yeah, all of our, all of our complement proteins. Remember, there's over 20 different complement proteins. Yes, all of our complement proteins are constantly being produced by our liver, uh, primarily, but other locations are making our uh, complement proteins as well. Yep. Yeah, remember, one of the things we talked about homeostasis, one of the homeostasis we're doing is maintaining the, you know, the composition and the components of our blood. Our kidney plays an important role in that, our liver plays an important role in that. Well, so what I would say to that is, again, you're not responsible for the specific uh, details of the process. Just know what happens when C3A and C3B split, either purposely or spontaneously, and what those two components do. Yeah. All righty. As I mentioned, complement proteins aren't the only proteins along in providing some defenses. Another type of protein produced is a class of proteins known as interferons. Again, there are numerous specific uh, types of interferons, alpha and gamma and, and those. And like I said, I know you'll get into that more in micro. But in general, interferons are proteins that are secreted uh, by virally infected cells. Remember, one of the things we talked about is that cells produce uh, when they're infected by a virus, they produce abnormal proteins. Let's go back to the whiteboard and talk about this. I think I saved this, but I'll save it again just in case. Here is a happy, normal, healthy cell. And this happy, normal, healthy cell has a nucleus. It also has a rough endoplasmic reticulum. It also has a Golgi apparatus. I guess I have to put ribosomes on this. And way back in 430, we learned about protein synthesis. We learned that uh, in our D in our nucleus, uh, transcription uh, takes place where we make that portable temporary copy of the gene and convert it into messenger RNA. That messenger RNA goes to the ribosomes of our rough endoplasmic reticulum where translation takes place using our sequence of codons and the start codon and the end codon. We make a sequence of amino acids, which then go to our Golgi apparatus where it is cut, it is modified, it is folded into functional proteins. And then those functional proteins leave the Golgi apparatus and are either released from the cell or serve some function in the cell and all the other things that you learned in 430 that I shouldn't have to go over. However, what happens when it is infected by a virus, typically using that protein coat we talked about, that virus is going to attach itself to the surface and it is going to inject oops, some type of genetic material into the cell. That genetic material can be some type of DNA, 
oops, red, in which case that DNA will move into the nucleus, or it could be some type of RNA. And if it is some type of RNA, then that RNA is going to go to the ribosomes, oops, nope, where it will be read by the ribosomes. Either way, what starts to happen is we start making these viral proteins that are then cut and modified. And our Golgi apparatus then basically is used to then make copies of the virus. This cell fills with copies of the virus until this cell bursts and releases these out of the cell. And those affect the further cells and the process continues. All right. Hopefully that's not too much new information for, too, for too many people. I think we all have kind of a basic understanding of what viruses do. Now, basically this virus is hijacking the protein making process for the cell. However, as it turns out, the cell is not completely unaware of this process. So again, our virus hijacks the protein making process. but the cell is not unaware of that. So while the cell is being forced to make the proteins and the materials necessary for this virus, the cell is also going to start making its own proteins. And it's gonna to start to make some special proteins called interferons. These interferons don't do anything for this cell. Instead, it makes these interferons and releases them from this cell. So while it's making all of these, and we'll go with circles this time. While it's making all of these viral proteins, it also starts making these interferons and it makes these interferons and releases these interferons out of the body of the cell into the interstitial fluid. And these interferons are a warning signal. Right? Cells, as it turns out, are very altruistic, right? If they were in the trenches with you in World War I, and someone tossed a grenade down into this, your cell would happily dive on top of that grenade, sacrificing itself to save you. And that's basically what these interferons are. They're a warning signal from this cell saying, hey, I'm infected, I'm a goner, but you can protect yourself. And so that's what happens. Sitting over here right next to this infected cell, is a healthy cell. Yep, these interferons are being released before the cell bursts. Here is a healthy cell with its nucleus and its rough endoplasmic reticulum and its Golgi apparatus and all of that stuff, yammer, yammer, yammer and it's got some receptors on the surface. And what happens is these interferons will come and bind to this receptor. So it's released by the infected cell, binds to the receptor, and when it binds on the receptor of this healthy cell, it triggers the healthy cell to make antiviral proteins. These antiviral proteins do two things. The first thing they can do is start to either stop or at least limit the binding of the virus. 
So when the virus comes and tries to bind to our healthy cell, it can be producing these antiviral. Did you say that this round was gone? Yeah. These antiviral proteins that stop the virus from binding. And obviously, if we stop the binding, we Nine stop four and a half. We stop the binding, we stop the infection. It can't uh, infect this cell. Or the other type of antiviral proteins that it can make and stop the binding, or it can limit the viral replication. So it may be possible that the virus is still able to bind. The virus still may be able to inject its genetic material, but these special antiviral proteins can block the reading of that genetic material. Which again, if you think about it, is the point of our second line of defense. Stop the spread, limit the spread, limit the damage. In this way, we can reduce the number of cells that are infected. We can reduce how many new viruses are being made we can limit the response. And again, notice we don't care what type of virus this is. Doesn't matter whether it's a cold virus or coronavirus or any other type of virus, it's gonna cause the exact same type of effect. So again, it's still part of our non-specific defenses. And again, I've done an amazing job of drawing this, but let's take a look at the pretty pictures from your textbook. So again, a viral infected cell releases these interferons, this chemical signal that's gonna to bind to the healthy cell, inhibit our viral infection, inhibit replication. And because these interferons are being released into the interstitial fluid, they can also help to activate other body defenses. Again, increase inflammation, uh, attract phagocytes, uh, attract the natural killer cells to the area, bring you know the bodyguards to the area and all those types of things. Uh, to help to um, limit the spread. And again, here's the pretty picture that goes along with that. All right. Questions on this? All right, so we've seen cells involved in our second line of defense. We've seen different types of chemicals involved in our second line defense. Question in the chat, sir. Oh, sorry, I didn't see it. Um, no, great question. Interferons are only being produced uh, when uh, they are, um, when the cell is infected. When the cell is infected, that it, and it is making those abnormal proteins for the virus, that is when, as you can see here, that interferon gene is turned on and so not only are we being forced to make more viruses in this cell, but the cell also produces this warning signal that is released as a result of that. So yeah, no, it's only being produced when the cell is infected. So that way you're just letting the cells know, you're letting your neighbor know, hey, there is a virus here right now, protect yourself. Because we don't want these cells making antiviral proteins all the time, that's a waste of resources. We only want to making these antiviral proteins when there's an actual virus present, so that we can protect ourselves. Great question, and thank you for whoever made me aware of it. I apologize for not catching that. All right, excellent. Any other questions on this? So we've talked about cells providing our second line of defense, talked about chemicals involved in our second line of defense. What's left with is a couple of processes involved in our second line of defense. And one of the big ones is inflammation. When I say inflammation, what are the four cardinal symptoms you think of in terms of inflammation? How can you tell if someone's in pain? pain? Swelling. Okay, I heard pain. I heard swelling. What else? Redness. Redness. And heat. Excellent. Yeah. Right? Those are the four cardinal symptoms which would be perfectly acceptable, except for the fact that we are in anatomy and physiology class. 
So of course we need to use the appropriate anatomical terms for these and the appropriate anatomical terms for these like most appropriate anatomical terms come from Latin. Rubor, calor, tumor, and dolor. Of course, rubor is a fancy way of saying what? Redness. That's the redness. Calor is the fancy way of saying what? Heat. Heat, excellent. Two more, the fancy way of saying? Swelling. Swelling. And that means dolor must refer to? Pain. Pain. Pain, excellent, there you go. Make sure you use appropriate anatomical terms. I will not accept redness, heat, swelling, and pain on the exam. All right. Now, the question is, what causes this? What controls, what mediates inflammation? What's the trigger, primary trigger for inflammation? Histamine. There you go, absolutely, right? This is primarily mediated, primarily controlled by histamine, although there are other chemicals that can be involved, uh, some prostaglandins, interferons, uh, CB, uh, a, as we talked about, there are other chemicals that can be involved, but typically when we think of the primary uh, mediator, the primary controller of inflammation, it's histamine. And can you give me some examples of some cells that contain histamine? Mast cells. Excellent. Where do you find those mast cells again? What's a common location where you find mast cells? Laura, where did you hear the, hear the term mast cell? You must have heard the term mast cell somewhere. When was that? Uh, when we did integument and connective tissue. When we, well, yeah, absolutely. In our connective tissues, which connective tissue has a lot of open space for, in it for stuff like mast cells? Or which uh, connective tissue should you guess when you don't know what tissue to guess? Because it's the most common. Areolar. Areolar. Excellent. Give me an example of another cell that uh, contains and releases histamine. Well, we learned one in the last section. What was that one? Is it eosinophils? Wasn't the eosinophils? Basophils. The basophils. Excellent. All right, the basophils, which of course are one of our white blood cells. And speaking of when we were talking about our skin in the integumentary system, was there an integumentary cell that also had the ability to release histamine? Does anybody remember? In the epidermis? epidermal dendritic cells, or what were also referred to as Langerhans cells, because good old Bob Langerhans was the first one who described them, are located in the skin. So these are just some of the examples we've talked about of cells that can release that histamine. What is it that histamine actually does? What does histamine actually do that causes the inflammation? You guys are getting all quiet. Is it time for another break? Must be getting close. We're almost there. They attract other cells to the area? How? Chemicals? True, okay. What's a good way of bringing cells to an area? If you want to bring anything- Vasodilation. There you go, absolutely. One of the big things it does is it dilates blood vessels. If you think about it, this dilation of blood vessels brings more blood to the area. And that more blood to the area is what causes the heat because we know blood is warm and the redness 
is caused by that. But the other thing the histamine does, oops, I spilled histamine. Does it also <laughs> increase the permeability? There you go. It increases the permeability of the capillaries. Oops. There. Which you're absolutely right, causes more interstitial fluid. And when there's more interstitial fluid, that's what gives us the swelling, the edema. And that edema uh, pushes on the nerve. And that pushing on the nerves causes the pain. This doesn't sound like a whole hell of a lot of fun. So why? Why have these effects? What's the increased the blood flow brings more white blood cells to kill the pathogen. More white blood cells uh, for the pathogens to the area. Is that all those dilated blood vessels bring to the area? What else are they bringing? Oxygen. More oxygen, more nutrients, more chemical signals all of which can help to mediate healing, right? That heat increases metabolism. And that increased metabolism helps in the defense and in the repair, right? All of that sounds like good stuff. So why the pain? So you're aware of the injury? Absolutely, right? I love that, aware, right? If you, right, class is done today, you're super excited, so you go skipping downstairs because you've got such a beautiful day, may hit 70 outside, so you wanna go for a run, but you roll your ankle going down the stairs, right? And it inflames and becomes swollen, right? And painful. Are you likely to go run five miles on that sprained ankle? No. no, it provides awareness. Absolutely. That pain, that swelling provides awareness of it so that we protect it. Right. And one more thing, that swelling, not only does it cause the pain so that we're aware of it, but it also congests the area. Remember, one of the goals of our second line of defense is to limit the spread. If we bring all this stuff to the area and congest the area, it makes it harder for those pathogens to leave that area as well. So again, this can play an important role in helping to limit the spread of that harmful pathogen. So while inflammation may not be very fun, it is very important. Now, I love this picture. This picture does a really nice job of showing all of the processes of this in kind of one step. Notice we have an injury like a splinter through our skin, causing chemicals to be released from that damaged tissue and also allowing bacteria in. Those chemical signals trigger our mast cell here to release the histamine. And notice the histamine causes our blood vessel to dilate and it increases the size of the intracellular clefts so that it becomes more leaky, bringing more oxygen, more nutrients to the area, as well as we know, making it easier for that diapetesis, making it easier for those neutrophils to uh, squeeze through those intracellular clefts and become the phagocytes that can help to start to attack those pathogens. Notice that dilation allows more complement proteins to come out, right? Antibodies to kind to it, making it easier for us to recognize these harmful things. So again, this one simple illustration does a nice job of lumping all of the process of inflammation into one just really simple illustration. All right, last but certainly not least, Oh, and then you got a pretty flow chart from your textbook that talks about all of this, yada, yada, yada. Um, fever, 
last physiological process we're going to talk about for our second line of defense is fever. One of the things, in fact, it was the very first homeostatic process we talked about in 430 on the first day of class uh, was to talk about regulating body temperature and how vitally important it is to maintain body temperature. But with fever, we still need to maintain homeostasis, but what we do is we basically reset the thermostat. We move the thermostat upwards. This is primarily done chemically. A, a protein called pyrogens are secreted by the leukocytes when they're exposed to a pathogen. This affects our hypothalamus, which is where that temperature control occurs, our medulla where these things occur. And it causes our temperature to be elevated. It decreases uh, sweat production because again, we don't want to bring temperature down. It's one of the ways you can tell when a fever breaks, right? You get all sweaty as a result of it. A fever is typically considered a temperature above 99 degrees Fahrenheit. But again, we think of it as being a bad thing, but a moderate fever is actually very beneficial. One of the things that having a, a increased temperature does is it triggers the liver and spleen to store things like iron and zinc, which can play an important role in helping to limit uh, the replication and spread of viruses. It also dramatically increases our body's metabolism, helping us to build defenses, helping us to repair, helping us to make it a hostile environment for that pathogen. An increase in as little as one degree Celsius can cause a 10% increase in your base metabolic rate. So it has a very, very huge significant effect. So that moderate temperature of 100.1 is definitely good for helping you to fight off that harmful pathogen. And if 100.1 is good, then 105.1 would be even better, right? I see a couple of people shaking their heads no. Why not? Why is it more chemistry, better? Chemistry professor said that the body can't do its like chemical changes over certain temperatures. Okay, first of all, chemists know nothing. You shouldn't listen to anything that they say. All right, but you are correct in that biologists tell you that uh, our body has proteins. Remember about you know, 20% of the stuff in our body is proteins, right? And as we know, proteins are highly sensitive to pH change and temperature change, absolutely. Many of the hormones in our body, pardon me, many of the proteins in our body are enzymes, right? Again, we're always careful in anatomy and physiology of using terms like always, using terms like never. But every single chemical reaction that has been studied in the human body they have found an enzyme that facilitates it and makes it happen more easily. Now, again, remember what that means. That doesn't mean that every single chemical reaction that takes place in your body uses an enzyme. There are plenty of chemical reactions that don't use enzymes, but every chemical reaction that takes place in your body has enzymes that facilitate it, can help it and make it happen more efficiently. And if the temperature gets too high, then you run the risk of denaturing those proteins, denaturing those enzymes, and dramatically reducing the efficiency of your body's functions. And that can be very dangerous. So when that baby has a really high 105 degree uh, fever, do you dump it into a bucket of ice water as a result of that? No. no. Why not? That, wouldn't that bring the temperature down? But that's dangerous also. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you're absolutely right. A high fever absolutely is dangerous, but rapid changes in temperature can be equally dangerous, especially in babies, right? Uh, there's the magical 10 month, 10 kilogram period of time uh, during development in babies uh, where their neurodevelopment is at a stage, usually it occurs around 10 months of age or around 10 kilograms of weight uh, where their axons aren't fully myelinated yet. And so what happens is not only when they get a high fever, but when they have a rapid change of temperature, either rapidly going up or also rapidly coming down, 
they can get inappropriately big, huge neural activity that occurs. And what do they call that situation when that occurs in that baby? Anyone know? A seizure? A fibril seizure. There you go. Absolutely. A fibril seizure. Fibril seizures are not uncommon in infants around those ages uh, and are truly terrifying for parents when they occur. The good news is that with fibril seizures, in most instances, they are benign and they are not indicative of any type of long-term implications from them, but they're scary as hell when they occur. Um, from those. So yes, so rapid changes in body temperature can be equally as dangerous as that high fever. So you put it into a warm bath to help to bring it down, not cold water. And don't do what grandmas used to do in olden days, right? They would take alcohol, rubbing alcohol and putting it on the baby because that alcohol would evaporate off really, really quickly and would drop the temperature, which would effectively drop the temperature very rapidly, which we now know is a bad thing. But the other problem with that is they have a very small or very large, I should say, surface to volume ratio. They have a very small volume, huge surface compared to that. So when you put alcohol on their surface, you get them drunk. Of course, that's what grandma used to do, right? And the problem with that is that grandpa was drinking the rubbing alcohol. So what did they do to all rubbing alcohols in the United States because too many people were drinking them? Made it taste gross. Well, it wasn't so much that they made it taste gross, so that they did, they denatured the alcohol. Basically by denaturing the alcohol, your body can't process it and it gets you sick. So now when you put it on the, on the body, the good news is they don't get you know, drunk anymore, but they can get really, really sick from that. Yep, grandma's always trying to get kids drunk. Absolutely. That's how you keep them under control. Yeah, whiskey on the gums can be another problem with that as well. Again, small, uh, a large surface to volume ratio, and that can cause problems. So don't do that. Don't give kids alcohol. All right. All right. Excellent. So your body's got these great pictures. Oh, we didn't nasal hairs. There you go. The vibrissi. That was something we didn't talk about. Uh, when we were uh, talking about uh, some of the protections or the eyelashes or the hairs in our nose and our ears, things along those lines. So we didn't talk about those, but here we have a lot of those uh, great examples of innate defenses, our first line of defense, our second line of defense, and those things that we've talked about. And what that leaves us with is our third line of defense. All right, we have to talk about our third line of defense. We have some other heavy lifting we need to do before we get there. But again, this is a good natural stopping point for this section. So let's go ahead and take our second break. Uh, we will come back, it looks like at 1048 and restart at that time. And I will start the recording at that time. All right, so any questions before we take our last break? I do have a question about the febrile seizure. Um, yes. Is it any rapid swing in body temperature or is it just up or is it up, up or down? No, up or down, so any rapid change. So it can occur both from a rapid increase but also from a rapid decrease, which again is why the, is the other reason it's not good to put alcohol or put them in the ice bath or put something along those lines. It's the change in temperature. So yes, a rapid increase in temperature uh, can trigger it, but also a rapid decrease in temperature can as well. Yeah, it's the change that appears to be. And again, we don't fully understand why it occurs. It has something to do with uh, the incomplete myelination of the axons at that point that make them more susceptible to that. But like I said, it can be truly terrifying when it occurs. Little, uh, we had that with her when she was younger where she uh, had a fibril seizure in the middle of the night and scared the bejesus out of my wife. But the good news is she then was very shortly surrounded by seven uh, firemen in her nursery and she was uh, very happy about that. All righty, any other questions? All right, I will see you guys in 15 minutes. So, the last thing I want to do for today is start our introduction to the third line of defense. As I said, I do want to at least leave you a little bit of time in the classroom to uh, meet in your groups and discuss uh, any information that you guys need to. Hopefully you've already been working on meeting using your discussion boards. Again, please on your discussion boards, uh, make a post that gives me your topic and also the name of all your people in your group. So please make sure you're doing that as well. Last thing we have to talk about is our third line of defense. 
our third line of defense is also different from the first two in that it is our specific defense system, our specific immunity. And when we talk about it being specific, we mean that it is specific to the antigen. Those antigens we keep talking about, those proteins, or some of them are lipids, some of them are carbohydrates or some combination of those, those bumps and irregularities on the surface of a cell that allows us to recognize it and tell that self from non-self. This gives us tremendous versatility, right? Not only can we attack a virus different from the way we attack a bacteria, but we can attack virus A differently than we attack virus B. So that is a huge advantage to this. It allows that versatility. It allows that precision that allows this system to be incredibly effective. We are, can be incredibly efficient in how it deals with that pathogen. And unlike inflammation where I hurt my hand and my hand swells, our uh, specific defenses, our third line of defense can be systemic. It can influence and affect our entire body. And not just right now when I am directly under attack, but in the future as well. One of the keys to this third line of defense, this specific immunity, is once we've made those tools, we have a memory with those tools. And that memory allows us to produce a faster, longer lasting, and more aggressive response than the first time makes it very, very powerful. So powerful, in fact, that in many instances, when you are exposed to that pathogen for a second time, you will have little to no symptoms as a result of that. Again, this makes this an incredibly powerful tool, an incredibly important tool. If there is a downside, to this, what is the one sole downside to this third line of defense, to this specific immunity? You have to have been exposed first? Not necessarily. That's a great question. It doesn't necessarily re uh, require that, although in many instances it does. Uh, obviously, this is, let's say it that way, enhanced by exposure. So yes, that, it, that exposure is necessary in many cases to produce that immunity. But what's the other problem? Is it time consuming? Yeah, it's a relatively slow process, right? It may take weeks to build up uh, that defense, right? And unfortunately, depending on the aggressiveness of the pathogen, you may not have weeks to protect yourself from it. So if there is one downside, it is the slow, the potential slowness of this process. Absolutely. All right. Now, obviously, we're talking about our three lines of defense individually, you know, sp specifically, uh, but obviously, they all work hand in hand. We did mention how our innate defenses can influence our specific defenses and vice versa as well. So all of this is meshing and working together. They're not truly independent in how they're working on this. All right. Now, when we think of specific defenses, our third line of defense, we think of our immune response. And that is a fairly accurate way of describing it. But one of the important things we need to emphasize is that there are different types of immunity. There are several different types of immunity. So we wanna make sure we understand what we mean and define both immunity and our quote unquote immune response, right? Again, this is our third line of defense. Right, this is that specific immunity, or I like their term resistance. And this again, allows us to respond to individual unique uh, pathogens. But there are two main types 
of immunity. The first is what we call our innate immunity. One of the things we keep talking about, and again, we'll keep it simplistic for right now. We talk about, for instance, antibodies. We know they're Y-shaped proteins, and these Y-shaped proteins have different binding sites. Well, some can be square, some can be circles, some can be triangles. Does everybody have the exact same shape to their antibodies in their body when they're born? No. 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 We all have different numbers and different shapes to our antibodies. And where does this variation come from? Our parents. Right. And how did our parents give it to us? Passive immunity. Well, no, we're not talking about passive immunity in this case. That variation comes from our genes. Mm. It is genetically determined. What genes you have determine whether you have circles or squares or horseshoes or diamonds or whatever it is that you have. And at a basic fundamental level, this information is important to us. They did a really interesting study many years ago where they put a bunch of singles in a group. Uh, and what you would do is you would go and you would spend five minutes interacting with somebody of the opposite sex. At the end of that time, you would smell the nape of their neck and then you would move on to the next person. And at the end of the night, you rated the people that you interacted with based on how attractive you found them. Then, they went and sequenced the individuals uh, genetically. And what they found is that people were more likely to be attracted to people who were genetically diverse from them. People that had different genes from them tended to be more attractive than people who had similar genes. And again, if you think of this from an evolutionary or from a biological standpoint, if you wanna produce a vigorous, robust, healthy offspring, do you want someone who has the same genetic defenses as you or someone who has different genetic defenses to pass on to those kids? Different. Different, absolutely. So being able to have that genetically determined variations, uh, some people just innately have a better starting point for their immune system than others. And that is solely determined by genetics. Right? What genes you get can influence uh, what, uh, how much defense your body gets. Of course, as we just talked about, variety is indeed the spice of life here. So when you think of uh, some of the, uh, you know, obviously the Nazis with their racial purity and how important that was, but even the United States, you know, there was a huge eugenics movement, uh, primarily more against uh, people with uh, mental disorders and things along those lines, but other things along those lines as well, right? When you're thinking about race uh, purity, Right, that's actually counterintuitive for something like this. So again, as someone mentioned, opposites attract, variety is definitely the spice of life. Those genetics are definitely important. Does that mean though, if you don't have the gene to protect you from a cold virus, you can never be protected from that cold virus? No. Is that what that means? No, no. right? Because the other thing we can get is an acquired immunity, right? This is basically what we took advantage of with the Indians, right? The Native, Americas to, the Native Americans in the United States. When we wanted to move west, we felt bad. So we would give them blankets. Yes, we're moving you off your land, but here are these wonderful blankets. And of course, what did those blankets have in them? Smallpox. Smallpox, absolutely, because they didn't have, most of them didn't have the innate immunity that would protect them from smallpox. However, did all of them die from smallpox? No, because some had some immunity that was similar or was able to protect them and they were able to pass it on to their offspring. And many of them were able to acquire immunity. With acquired immunity, this is not what you're born with. But what you get from your environment.
Again, you may have genes that you were born with because maybe many generations ago, your great grandfather came to the United States via the Panama Canal. And while passing through the Panama Canal, he got exposed to malaria and built up an immunity. And that immunity was able to be passed on and became innate in your family. And you can have that cell that's gonna protect you from malaria. But if you never go to Panama, you may never run into malaria and you may go your entire life without ever using that defense cell. But if you don't have that defense cell, that means you shouldn't go to Panama. You just have to be careful when you go to Panama because when you get exposed to it, you can acquire that immunity. So one is what you're born with, one is what you get from your environment. Now, obviously we can't change what we are born with, but can we influence and change our acquired immunity? Absolutely. So when we talk about acquired immunity and someone kind of already hit this on the head, when we talk about acquired immunity, we talk about active and passive acquired immunity. So again, we wanna have the whole phrase here, active acquired immunity. What's happening with our active acquired immunity? Obviously we are exposed to something. What are we exposed to in this case? Pathogen. Yeah, pathogen. And more specifically, again, in this case, the antigen of the pathogen. Right, we're exposed to the antigen of a pathogen. And what happens when we're exposed to the antigen of the pathogen? We recognize it as not self and initiate an inflammatory response. Absolutely, not just an inflammatory response, but an immune response. Our cells do the work. We recognize it, we divide, we protect, we do all of those things. So our cells do the work. And a result of our cells doing the work, we get the benefit. And the in this case, we get those memory cells that are going to help to protect us long-term from that exposure of the pathogen. Conversely, with a passive acquired immunity, in this case, we are given the defense, in this case, we're exposed to the defenses often in the forms of antibodies. We get antibodies from something, All right? Notice because we are given the antibodies, our cells do not do the work. And since our cells do not do the work, we do not get memory. So is one of these good and one of these bad? What do you guys think? Pink good, green bad, green good, pink bad? Just different, not good or bad. Yeah, absolutely, they're different. And so not surprisingly, there are advantages and disadvantages to both. What is the obvious advantage of the active acquired immunity? Memory. Yeah, that long-term protection, that memory that is gonna to help to protect us long-term from that should we get exposed to it again. What's the disadvantage? The exposure. Right, obviously this requires exposure. And with that exposure, there can be symptoms, right? Illness, damage, stuff like that. And as we also talked about, it takes time. 
It's a slow process. And that allows us to have those symptoms, to have that illness, to run that risk. The obvious disadvantage, as we talked about for the passive acquired immunity, advantage, disadvantage, is like we said, we're not doing the work, so no memory. So that doesn't know long-term health. But what's the advantage of this system? It's quicker. Speed, absolutely. The advantage is the speed. We get the defense cells, the dense chemicals we need faster, and so typically less symptoms, less time uh, for the healing process to occur with this. So, so you have what to are, go ahead. Would a vaccine fall into the active immunity category? What do you think? Yes. Absolutely. So guess I what? Say, I think it depends, doesn't it? Nope, doesn't depend at all. We just haven't, uh, we haven't gotten there yet. We're, but you're absolutely right. We have to look at yet another layer to these immunities that we're talking about. All right, but you absolutely are correct. Notice as was pointed out, there's not something inherently good or bad about either of these. There are advantages and disadvantages to both of them. But as you have so uh, pointedly pointed out, there are different types of active immunity and also different types of passive immunity. And that's exactly where we're gonna go next. So before we get there, any questions on the difference between active acquired immunity and passive acquired immunity? I have a question on the passive. Yes. How are you exposed to the diff how are you exposed to the antibodies if your cells aren't doing any work? Well, so someone give me an idea. As I mentioned, there's going to be two different ways, but so how would be if how would be a way for you to get antibodies without having to do any work in your body? Breast milk. Breast milk. If you're a baby whose immune system is not well, the 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 organs associated with your immune response are not fully functional yet you can get those antibodies passively from mom. Since you tend to hang out around mom a long period of time, what mom is exposed to from a pathogen, you are likely exposed to as a pathogen. So if mom starts producing antibodies to a pathogen, then you can get them from mom. Or maybe you're bitten by a snake. If you're bitten by a snake, your body actually has the ability to produce antibodies that combine to and cause phagocytes to destroy that poison in the venom. But if you're bitten by a snake, do you want to wait the 7, 10, 14 days to build up enough antibodies to destroy that venom in your blood? It'll be dead. Yeah. So when you get bitten by a snake, what do they give you? They give you anti-venom. Guess what that anti-venom is? It's basically antibodies that bind to and inactivate and lead to the destruction of the venom, stopping the spread. But essentially, that would only treat it at that point, correct? And what it, if you get bitten by, by the same snake, then you need the same anti-venom. Exactly. No long-term protection, no memory, but a much, much faster process. So can like antibiotics and stuff be a passive immunity also? Uh, like me any medication, I guess? Or No, so I, I understand where you're going with this. No, what I would say is that antibiotics are a way of, are a chemical way that we, uh, medicine that we use to directly attack the antibody, but it wouldn't be part of our, we wouldn't consider it necessarily a part of our body's defenses. I don't think you would even necessarily consider that a passive immunity uh, because in that case, it's, it's not antibodies. So that's the, really the key with this. With this active, acquire, with this active immu acquired immunity, we are, it's all about antibodies. either making the antibodies or getting the antibodies. So I don't think that that would necessarily fall into this category. It would be similar to a passive immunity, but not the same way. And when we're talking immunity, we're talking about antibodies. And so the real question is, do you make them or get them? All right, and that's the difference. 
active acquired, we make them, passive acquired, we get them. And that's really the difference here, which is actually a great lead in to the last thing we need to talk about, the different types of active and passive acquired immunity. Remember active acquired immunity. So let's write that out again. is where we make the antibodies, right? And because we're doing the work, we get the benefit. And that benefit is the long-term protection, the memory cells, All right? So with our active acquired immunity, it is this. Now, again, remember for this, we are exposed, let me move this out of the way, to the antigens of the pathogen. And there are two ways this can occur. The first is where we can actually be Given, well, let's do it this way. Uh, actually, I'll cheat. Well, how do I argue? The first way that this can occur is the more common way. And the more common way is when we are actually exposed to the pathogen. I don't know how I'm here, Olivia. I agree. All right. Those pathogens are bad news. Excellent. So the more common way is exposed to the pathogen. This where we're exposed to the pathogen is what we call naturally acquired. Active immunity. We're exposed to the actual pathogen. When this occurs, all right, we get sick. We have the symptoms, all right? We have to deal with the illness and all the results that go along with that, all right? That is a huge disadvantage to this process. But the advantage of this is should we survive it, we get a strong memory and that long-term protection. Remember, the key here is we're exposed to the antigen of the pathogen. If there was some way to just expose us to the antigen without actually having the virus or the pathogen associated with it, well, we would call that an induced acquired active immunity. And this, to answer the question that was answered early, is primarily via vaccines, All right? With a vaccine, you were either exposed to a dead, a weakened, or what we're, get, uh, what we're getting even better at now is just the pathogen itself. So dead, weakened virus, or we can just be exposed to the antigens. The advantage of this is that you are not actually exposed to the pathogen. And if you're not actually exposed to the pathogen, you don't get sick. All right, but you still produce memory cells. However, are the memory cells necessarily as robust as when you're actually exposed to the pathogen? No. Yeah. So typically we get a weaker memory from this and often we can help to boost that by requiring multiple 
injections or exposures, All right? So things like our vaccines are induced acquired active immunity. And notice we said the goal is to expose to the antigen. One of the really cool things about our COVID vaccines is most of them are actually our mRNA uh, vaccines, where basically we give the cells in your body the messenger RNA. And as a result of that, our cells make the foreign antigens. so that our body, our defenses can recognize them and build a defense. Vaccines are incredibly powerful this way, right? Back in ancient times, and by ancient times, I mean when I was in elementary school, little Jimmy down the street got chicken pox. So what did all the parents in our neighborhood do? Chicken pox party. Yeah, they brought us all down to Jimmy's house. They rubbed us all on Jimmy so that we would all get uh, the, the, uh, the chicken box vaccine. We were all sick, all out of school for the same week. And then life moved on, right? Naturally acquired active immunity. We were exposed to the pathogen. We all got sick. We all got better. We all got the memory cells, right? My daughters have never had and likely will never have chicken pox. Why? because they got a chicken pox vaccine. They're exposed to dead, or in some cases, just the antigens of the chicken pox virus. It's a virus that doesn't, that is very stable, does not change its shape very often. And so as a result of that, they build up the memory cells. Uh, you know, they had to have a couple doses of it, but they build up the memory cells, they get the defense, they get the memory. Part of the problem with things like the common cold, the flu, and now we're learning COVID, is these are things that mutate rapidly. And that's the, the only problem with precise uh, defense is when you have that precise defense, it is specific to the antigens. If a virus like COVID changes the shape of its antigens, then our memory doesn't recognize it anymore. And so when we get exposed to it, it's like getting exposed to it again as a new novel pathogen. It's a great question. So uh, while it mutates, the, some of those mutations may not necessarily be associated with where the antigen binds or how we recognize it. So it may be a slightly, you know, it's like an old key. You can have a key where the edges get rubbed down, where it may change the shape of it a little bit, but as long as it mostly still has the basic shape, it's still going to work in that lock. You may have to jimmy it a little bit more, but you're still going to be able to turn it in there. However, if you change it too much, then that key doesn't work any longer. And so it's really about how much of a change these variations are going. So that's why they're saying that it's still able to be effective while these changes may have a physiological difference. They may affect how rapidly they spread, how easy it is to catch them. The proteins on them are still similar enough that we can still build up a defense to them. And um, a quick question. So it, is there necessarily one more effective than the other, induced or naturally acquired? Because there's this debate right going on. If you've been sick with COVID, do you need to get a COVID vaccine or, or not? So great question. Uh, so here is my understanding of that debate. As we look at the, and again, general data, typically naturally acquired uh, because you're typically dealing with more of the virus inside of your body. So you're producing a more vigorous response, also meaning you produce more memory cells, typically gives you a much stronger protection. But especially if you had COVID a year ago, or something along those lines, the COVID uh, virus may have mutated enough where your memory cells may not be as effective because COVID may have changed enough where it's not gonna recognize it as much and might not be as vigorous. So then getting that vaccine could help to strengthen that uh, defenses to the more variant forms of the COVID that could be. 
So that's a great question. It is something that we're looking at. Um, so what's interesting about chicken pox and shingles is that it is, and again, this takes us a little down the rabbit hole away from, and again, this is something you'll definitely talk about more in micro, but the short version of this is that both chicken pox and shingles are what are referred to as a retrovirus. This is basically a virus that implants itself in a place like your spinal cord. And so what happens is uh, triggers like stress, caffeine, some other you know, diet, other things can cause that virus to express itself back out onto the surface of the skin in that fashion. So, uh, so because of the, the, these two uh, conditions are related to each other, exposure to chicken pox can lead to, uh, in, in, at, at, at a later time in your life, uh, the potential of having shingles as well. Yeah, and again, as we said, this being exposed to a, so let's talk about this a little more. And again, this is a perfect thing. And I love talking about this right now. This is the perfect time to be talking about it. Along those lines, uh, on uh, our module, there is a, um, a podcast known as Sawbones, which is normally a very uh, eclectic, uh, light, um, kind of fun, humorous look at the history of medicine. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the, the, the hosts of that have done an amazing job of really talking about uh, vaccines and COVID and COVID. I posted one of their first um, podcasts about, uh, you know, uh, Operation Warp Speed when, uh, when Trump finally said that. But they've done a lot of great stuff about the, the vaccine, about vaccine hesitance along those lines. So I strongly encourage you to look at those things or these things are, that you're interested in. But... Um, Again, we have the, the two things that I would say about this is yes, we are how long this lasts for is something that is definitely going to be an interesting question because of that variation. It may COVID may very much be like the flu, where it's something that is going to come around every single year and it's something that we're going to have to deal with as it continues to mutate. However, as we continue to build up defenses, it doesn't change. We're hoping that it won't change so much that it will be completely novel. And so as we start building up partial defenses, we will get less of severe responses as a result of that. The other important thing I want to point out about this is that vaccines, COVID or otherwise, do not get you sick. Yes, some of the older ones that used, for instance, weakened viruses uh, do have a small potential in people who are immune compromised of being able to overpower their body defenses and they could potentially get you sick. But if you're immune compromised, they don't use weakened viruses. They even use it less and less. The, they do still sometimes use it in the flu vaccine. So if you ever gotten a nasal flu vaccine, you know, the inhaled one, uh, that typically uses weakened live viruses, but tip, there are strict um, uh, conditions on who is able to get those because of those. But in general, vaccines do not get you sick. However, Remember, the point of active immunity is to get your body to do the work so you build the memory cells. So it is not uncommon with a vaccine to have uh, sick-like symptoms. You can get an elevated fever. You can get achy. You can feel a little um, unwell because of that because your body is doing the work like it normally would when you are infected. You're not actually infected, you're not actually doing damage, but you can feel that way. The other important thing to remember about vaccines is vaccines don't help, don't help you if you're already exposed. I think one of the greatest examples I see of this is in the flu vaccine. I have plenty of examples of avid students who tell me or family members who tell me they don't wanna get the flu vaccine because every time they get the flu vaccine, they get sick. Well, it's really one of three things that are happening. Either they're feeling the symptoms of their body doing the work, like it would be if they're sick. And so they may feel a little, but it's definitely less awful, as Allison pointed out. But there are two other things that could be happening as well. For some of them, especially people who are hesitant to get vaccines, what was the trigger that caused you to get it? Did you finally decide to get the flu vaccine because all the people you sit around at work got sick? because all the people that got around you at work got sick, so you decided to go get the vaccine. Well, at that point, you may already be infected, right? If you're already infected, getting the vaccine is not gonna help you. And 
getting the vaccine doesn't give you instant protection. It takes weeks to build up those defenses. So if you get the vaccine and then the next day someone sneezes on you, you're gonna get sick. So often it's those types of things. It's not a causality issue. It's more the relationship of those that are hurting, right? Correlation does not equal causation. Yeah, it's one of the reasons why they start flu vaccines early because they want to get it into you before everybody around you is getting sick. Because if everybody around you is getting sick, it may already be too late. All right. Notice also this naturally acquired active immunity. This, when we talk about our immune response, getting sick, building up a memory to it. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Oh, well. This is typically what we mean when we talk about our immune response. Our immune response, where we typically think about you get sick, you build up the memory, that is our naturally acquired active immunity. So like I said, when we talk about an immune response, this is really what we're talking about. But notice there's lots of different types of immunity. So again, let's take a look at the pretty picture here. So induced, right? Here we're giving the antigen to prevent the disease. Here we're getting it from exposure. And we already kind of hinted at this, but notice that passive immunity has two different types as well. Naturally occurring, and notice naturally occurring is when you're getting the antibodies from the breast milk, whereas induced is where you're basically getting some type of injection. Again, remember with passive immunity, you're not making the antibodies, you're getting the antibodies. So the difference is where are you getting the antibodies from? Are you getting it from the placenta? Are you getting it from the breast milk? Are you getting it naturally from mom? Or are you getting it artificially from some type of injection like that anti-snake venom? So passive immunity, and again, we kind of already talked about this. We didn't put the labels on them, but we already talked about naturally acquired a passive and induced passive immunity, the two different ways that we get those as well. All right, so that is immunity, all of its types. Innate, acquired, active, passive, natural, induced. Understand those, be able to describe those. Right. Again, I'm not giving away any trade secrets by pointing out this is the kind of thing that makes an excellent essay question. Can you give another example of induced passive other than antivenom? Sure. Um, COVID. One of the things that our old illustrious leader got was monoclonal antibodies, right? Someone who is, uh, it, it gets COVID, one of the things that they'll do is give them monoclonal antibodies. Basically, they inject them with antibodies, basically, that have been produced by other people. One of the things that they were looking for early on during the COVID process is if you were exposed to COVID, they wanted your plasma. Why did they want your plasma? They wanted your antibodies so that we could pass those antibodies on to somebody else. So that's another great example, relevant example, current example of an induced passive immunity. Again, doesn't help you long term, but we don't worry about long-term, we're worrying about right now. That snake venom is the perfect example. We wanna give you that anti-snake venom to stop the venom right now, to stop the damage right now. Now, if you're not a very good snake charmer or, or rustler or whatever they're called, and every week you're getting bit and every week you're having to get the anti-snake venom, over time, that small exposure of that to your body, will your body slowly be building up its own immunity to it? So if you continue to get bitten by a snake, and again, I'm not encouraging anybody to do this, but if you were really, really bad at your job as a snake wrangler and you got bit by a snake every week, at least once a week for a year, eventually could you build up your own immunity to that? Yeah, probably, right in time. I don't think it's necessarily anybody wants to do, probably not part of the job performance, but uh, technically something like that could happen as you continue to expose little by little, you could produce your own. But again, you're not gonna wait for that. I don't know who Riddick is. 
So I think more of it in terms of Wesley to Iocane powder. All right, there you go. Laura gets me. All right, excellent. All right, questions on that? All right, uh, this took a little longer than I had hoped for, but again, I think this is important to get through with this. So uh, we still have our third line of defense to talk about. Now that we understand what I mean by our immune response, we can talk about our immune response, but we still have about an hour left. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break you guys up into the breakout rooms. So you would have to give me a second to get that set up again for all of you so you guys can meet and get together. Uh, if there are any questions or concerns you have about, from your group, especially about your topic, and now would also be the time to talk to me about that as well. All right, so it's gonna, like I said, it's gonna take me a few minutes to get the group set up. Any questions before we get started on that? All right, so again, at this point, I am done with all the directed information. This is now your time to use how you want to do it effectively. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording. I will break you up into groups, which will take a little bit of time to get the rooms organized. I did it randomly last time, but now I'm gonna to have to purposely uh, separate you into the groups that you're supposed to be in and uh, get you guys going that way. And then, like I said, you have the rest of the class time to use however you want. I will stay here uh, in case you guys have any questions or anything along those lines. All right. Excellent. All right. So any other questions? All right. I will go ahead and stop the recording.